Amen. Thank you. Let us, let us uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Uh, Fifteen years later, we're still here as a nation. We pray, Lord, that you instill in us uh, thankfulness for your grace. We're still here. We're, able, we're still legal to, to, uh, to present the gospel, to witness, to worship, and uh, open the Bible. It's still legal. And, Lord, it's only by your grace that it's, we can do these things. So, Lord, I thank you for preserving this nation. We don't deserve it, but you, you shine your grace on us. So we, I pray, Father, that as we open your word today, that you would speak to our hearts. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. It seems like today all of the testimonies, um, the music, that's, that's manna. <laughs> that's what we do. Amen. And I, I'm not going to be too long. I think it's stretch out the service. But I had three. I'm in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you have your electronic devices, or Pastor Brown said we used to wave our Bibles, and, but now we have electronic devices, tablets, and whatever. We get, bring the Word of God, 1 Kings chapter 17, and the name of the message, the restorer of, of our souls. Um, initially, I said Elijah the Tishbite, but now I changed it, the restorer of our soul, and... Um, I'm going to start in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Just keep in mind these three ideas. Uh, Elijah's private life, his public life, and his restoration. Those three ideas as we look into um, 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 18, and 1 Kings 19. Not all the verses, but from those three separate chapters. Uh, in Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, of Gilead said to Ahab, Elijah the prophet is before King Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except by my word. Then the, Lord of, then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there the ravens to feed you there so he went and did according to the word of the Lord for he went and stayed by the brook, brook Cherith which is a small stream which flows into the Jordan the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the Lord was guiding Elijah. It says, as the, um, the Lord led him to do that, as the Lord God of Israel lives, the word of the Lord came to him. The Lord was speaking to him. I know I was thinking, if I had told Sister Kathy, you know, the Lord told me to go down by a stream, we want to be there for a while, the Lord has sent me there. She'd probably say, you got your signals right? <laughs> Um, but the Lord was speaking to Elijah. And key to this, I think key, one of the keys to understanding this particular scripture is that the Lord said to him uh, in verse 3, Hi, and hide by the brook Cherith. He said, hide. Um, indicates a private, some types of a private solitude. He said, hide yourself. So the private ministry, get out of the sight of the public and hide. That's what the Lord told him to do. Go hide yourself. So that's what Elijah did. He was an obedient servant. By the way, he's Elijah the Tishbite. I said, what is a Tishbite? Well, basically, it's a person from the region of Tishbe. That's what, that was his, his uh, birthplace. Um, and sometimes that word tish, Tishbe is, or Tishbite is, is referred to as stranger. And Elijah was different from his culture. He was, he was probably labeled strange. 
um, but it was strange in a good way. And so, I just scenario if um, Elijah came to the steps of Manor Bible in today's world, and he said, I want to serve here, I want a job here, can I serve here? And what do we would probably say, well, what credentials do you have spiritually to be a part of this fellowship? Right. You want to serve on the board of pharmacy? I mean, <laughs> I've been working too hard. <laughs> I've been working real too. You know, I got in at midnight last night, and I got up at 5 this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. The board of elders. <laughs> I've been working too hard. Um, and we probably said, well, what spiritual conditions do you have? And um, verse 1 says, Elijah the Tishbite, um, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, Elijah stood in the presence of the Lord. He knew the Lord. He has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, which is the most important thing. He is saved. Are you saved? That's what we, I emphasize when I teach or whatever I do. I, do are you saved? I mean, I don't, we, don't, we don't have sinless perfection around here, but do you know the Lord? Are you saved? You know, where, where are you going when you leave this life? Um, but he says, before I, whom I stand, he was in the presence of the Lord. And uh, one commentary says, as if unveiling the very secret of their lives, the reason for their strength and for their undaunted bearing and bold fronting of all antagonism. And that's how we can face this world because we are saved. Jesus lives in us. And so that's first credential. And then it says, uh, the Lord sent them before a king. Here's a scripture in Proverbs says, if you are good at what you do, you will stand before kings. Elijah was a chosen vessel for the Lord, second credential. He was chosen. If you're saved, you're chosen to do as the Lord got you. Um, you're, if you um, and so he stood before the king, uh, uh, king Ahab, who was uh, incidentally very wicked. And he warned him of a famine to come. He said it's gonna, he warned him that it's going to be a drought in the land. No water, no, not, no dew. And um, so he warned them. Um, and so we are chosen vessels to share the good news. Amen. Wherever we are, we are, we are chosen vessels to share the good news. Um, and so Ahab's character was very wicked. And for example, um, the scripture tells us that um, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who, had, who were before him, more than all the wicked kings of Israel before. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Then he took as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Baal is a false god. He's the representative king of Israel, and he worshiped a false god. Yeah. And so the Lord, say the least, was angry. He was angry with his nation, and he did bring judgment. Um, and, you know, one thing I've noticed, if you're a Christian, if you love Jesus, well. um, people who hate Jesus, don't be surprised when that anger turns on you. I mean, I just observation. If you love Jesus, people who hate Jesus, don't be surprised when that anger turns on you. I think it's a principle. I, it's probably, I, I don't know. It's, it's, I just observed that. Um, and so, um, but one thing, just as the stars shine brighter and brighter against the night sky, Believers will shine brighter and brighter in our decaying culture. As this nation is going down morally, it's getting darker and darker and darker. 
But believers will shine brighter and brighter because of the darkness. So, and then the third characteristic, um, he knew the supernatural provision of the Lord. Yeah. Testimonies we heard this morning testifies to God's supernatural provision. And I got some stories too. I have some stories. I'm gonna share one. I was I was working <laughs> I was working in Bethesda, maybe ten I don't know, ten years ago, and my wife Kathy she came down with lymphoma, and one of my technicians, he was three hundred pound guy, and he's a believer, and he says Ron I heard your wife is sick I said yeah he said well. Um, I'm going to go into my secret closet. He said, and I'm not sure he, no one has secret power or anything. He says, I've never lost a case. <laughs> but I, he's, I don't I want to attribute that power to him, but my wife is here. So believers praying for one another, there's power. More than a medical field or anything like that. So there's power in prayer because of the God we pray to. So, but Elijah knew the supernatural provisions of the Lord during a time of famine. Verse 1 says there was going to be no dew. And then 1 Kings 17, verse 2 says, then, uh, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And I, I think Elijah was there one, two years. I, I'm not sure. But the Lord provided for him. Yeah. And it was a strange way. I mean, I, we look at the scripture. I take it literally unless otherwise indicated. The, I believe that the ravens, I don't know if it represented peoples of that. Of that but it, if the birds brought them food to put. God could do it. They're a scavenger. And so the Lord, the Lord provided. And there's a commentator in what Matthew Henry says, but there's a river which makes glad the city of God that never runs dry, a well of water that springs up to eternal life. Lord, give us that living water. You, in that t time of famine, uh, I'm sure Elijah was being fed, not only physically. Um, next uh, credential, Elijah. Elijah knew that the Lord would provide enough, but he also knew that the Lord was more than enough. Yeah. After the brook dried up, Elijah went to stay with a widow and her son in a place called Zarephath. Yeah. The Lord showed Elijah that the Lord is not only enough, he's more than enough. There, there was a severe famine in the land. The Lord promised Elijah that he would provide for him the widow and the widow's son. The wid this widow and her son were literally down to their last meal. First Kings 17 verse 12 says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, this is the widow, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She's, she's literally down to her last meal. And the prophet of God, Elijah, comes. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home. Do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. And in all three, three chapters it kept saying, the God of Israel says, the God of Israel says, go here, he went, go there, he went. And the Lord speaks to us in certain, in certain things. If you, if the Lord said, go witness to someone, share the gospel. I, I don't think he would, you would be wrong. I don't think you'd be disobedient. I don't think you'd be misguided. Share the gospel. And so the jar of flour will not be used up 
the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. And then 1 Kings 17, 15. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And, and she and he and her household ate for many days. Yeah. The bin of flour was not used up, yeah. nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which yeah. he spoke Amen. by Elijah. Amen. The Lord spoke the planets into existence. Yeah. He created the universe and he created you and me. He is more than enough. He can supersede normal conditions and feed us in the midst of a famine just like Elijah. Um, the next credential, Elijah knew the resurrection power of God. While Elijah was living with this widow and her son, the son became sick and he died. The Lord used Elijah to raise the widow's son from the dead. Um, 1 Kings 17, verse uh, 17. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms, carried him in the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out, he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he, re he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. God can... He has power over death. Yes. So Elijah was definitely was a man of prayer. It says, I pray. It wasn't Elijah. It was the God of Elijah that he prayed to. And the Lord heard his prayer, revived his son, the widow's son. And also Elijah was obedient. Every time the word of the Lord came to him to do something, he did it. He was obedient. So I think if Elijah came here, to man of Bible, I think we would welcome him on the, on the, uh, the elders board, without a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> I mean, he saw so many spiritual credentials. And um, here's a question for the, um, some of the uh, young ones like maybe Brother Craig and Carday. They've come up through our um, church school, Sunday school. There were only two, and I don't want to really put them on the spot. There were two Old Testament saints that did not see physical death. Can you name one of them? One, both of them? <laughs> there are two Old Testament saints that didn't see physical death. Can you name them? Well, I don't want to, we're going to go back to that lesson. Um, one of them was Elijah, and the other one was Enoch. Enoch. Uh, Elijah and Enoch. Okay, now we're going to um, his public ministry. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, go hide yourself. And then the Lord told him, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and it, came pat, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. He said, go present yourself, go show yourself. So he's more public now. Um, Elijah made, a, in, in, the, in that scenario, I'm not gonna go through the whole chapter, but in that scenario, 
Elijah was very sensitive to his culture around him. He knew that the Israelites were being disobedient to the Lord. Culture, morally, they were decaying, and they were worshiping false gods. So Elijah made a proposition to the wicked king Ahab. He said, have all the prophets to come together on Mount Carmel. Elevated place and probably enough place, uh, sources of water at, ele at that elevation. In uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter or limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. You know, Elijah, at that point, he, he did feel alone. And I, I remember vividly being on a college campus, and it wasn't a Christian college. And I, and I was, at that time, I was seeking truth. I wanted seeking a closer relationship with the Lord. And I said, I don't think anybody on this campus is seeking the Lord, you know. And I did feel alone. But, um, Elijah felt alone in the people, it says in, in, this, in verse 21, but the people answered him not a word. The people of Israel, he said, choose this day what God you're going to follow. He ain't say nothing. And um, they should have said, well, I know in this church we say we follow the Lord. And they didn't say anything. Um, and I think the conditions of this, of our culture can deteriorate where, and it is, I follow the God of the Bible. I don't, and then on the one side, I don't even uh, believe there is a God. I worship another God. And some people don't even care. They don't. They don't care. <laughs> but, and so the conditions of this contest between false God and true and living God. First uh, Kings eighteen twenty three. Therefore let, therefore let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, yeah. and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. Right. And I will prepare, I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers, the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So the prophets of Baal, they called on the false gods from morning to evening. In verse 29, it says, but there was no voice. And I can't, I, I know why. False gods are dead. They don't live. There's no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah called on the true God, the God of the Bible, the only God, the God who responds in his speaking today. He called on that, the true and living God. And before calling on the Lord, Elijah had the altar saturated with water. Not one time, but three times. And I don't know how many gallons of water he used, but he did it three times. <clears throat> and I, I said, well, why three times? And I, he can't be dogmatic, but the God, the true and living God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And 1 Kings 18, 36, and it came to pass <clears throat> at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and, J and Israel, let it be known this day <clears throat> that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me. Hear me, O Lord, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the, the burnt sacrifice in the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. 
Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. <clears throat> the Lord, he is God. In verse 40, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Elijah knew that the Lord would respond because he knew in a very intimate way the Lord and the Lord did respond. Amen. He knew him. Amen. And we can know him too. Yeah. <clears throat> we need to know his ways because we live in conditions similar to Elijah's day. You know, there's a lot of, we don't call them Baal worshipers, but there are people, and we can have, we can, like the Israelites, we can fall into that pattern, just like the Israelites of that day. <clears throat> We can become worshipers of false gods. Um, for example, we can get into ourselves. Me, myself, and I. My best three friends. And we can get into the worship of money and materialism. We can make comfort and pleasure of God. We can make evolution of God. The LGBT agenda, that can become a God. Education can become a God. And we should be learners, and we want to learn of the Lord and learn more of his creation, but it's not God. Science can become a God. Self-effort, the God of sports and sports figures can become a type of God. I guarantee you, today there are going to be thousands of stadiums filled. And you know, I, I, I love sports too, but some of it is borderline fanatic fanaticism, you know, people's, um, like if your team lose, the next day that people like in a bad mood and <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> or, or if you, at a, at, someone told me, they were at the Ravens game and I think the Steelers beat them at the last second or something. She said, you couldn't imagine the, the words that I heard, the people coming out of the stadium. But sports can become a god. Um, and a lot of professional sports today is big business. Um, but we should worship the true God, God of the Bible, the God who created the world, the universe, the God who created us. And we, as we inherited Adam and Eve's sin and rebelled, so we're sinners, and we, obe we are accountable to our Creator. And because of our sin nature, we die physically. And we are die spiritually if we do not know our Creator. And that's the worst thing that could ha happen to a person, not only to die physically but to die spiritually. And, and because man, because of our sin nature, man dies. Do we worship the God who sent his son uh, to, the, to die on the cross for our sins? Do we worship him? He invites us to receive the remedy, the remedy for our sins through the death of his son, uh, Jesus Christ, that we may have that eternal life. That's the God we worship. Amen. Now the, the restoration. Um, Elijah had just experienced a great victory. And I think he was on a spiritual high. And maybe he thought God would take care of Ahab and Jezebel. It didn't work that way. But in 1 Kings 19 verse 1, Elijah had a collapse. He, uh, verse 1 Kings 19.1, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So Elijah took off running. Elijah took off running, 
And he left his servant, I don't know who it was, but he left his servant. He went on uh, another day's journey. In verse, 1 Kings 19.4 it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom or a juniper tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So Elijah got to the point he was despondent. He said, Enough. I, I want to... I want to check out, Lord. Just take me out of this. And um, so the question is, I, as I saw this, I said, what happened to this spiritual man of God? He is the same man in 1 Kings 17 and, and 18 who had, had a strong relationship with the Lord, who was a special chosen vessel of the Lord. He had learned the supernatural provision of the Lord. He had learned that the Lord was more than enough in life. He had been used as an instrument to raise a dead man, and he prayed down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. What happened to Elijah? And there's an excellent uh, commentary. There's an excellent commentary in the New Testament, and written by the brother of James. James 5.17, it reads, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So in Elijah's fallen humanity, in his fallen humanity, Elijah is, a, is human, just like we are. The word tell us that. In Elijah's fallen humanity, he took off running in fear when the wicked Jezebel threatened his life. And scriptures tell us that she would carry out those threats. She had, if she got in the way of her husband Ahab or her, she'd have you killed. Yes. So it wasn't a, a light threat. So Elijah took off running. And so certain things that characterize Elijah's collapse. One thing, the Lord never told him to run from Jezebel. It was his fallen humanity. And then another thing, he became fearful. He became fearful. And then verse 4 says, it says, he prayed that, the, that he might die. It seems like he may, he may have been suicidal and depressed. And he prayed that he, may, he might die. He said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take me. And I, I think it can happen to believers. Can believers commit suicide? Yeah. I think they can. But there's no sin that, can, that cannot be forgiven. But in sinful humanity, you become so despondent. And he also was exhausted and hungry. Verse 5 um, says that as he lay and slept, he was tired, exhausted, he was running maybe two, three hundred miles under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake of uh, baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and, he, and ate and drank and went on the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. It says the angel of the Lord. And as I looked at that, many times, I don't know if this is true of this passage, but I believe it is. The angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate Christ, a theophany. And I think out of God's grace, he, he came in a theophany and ministered to his servant Elijah and restored him. Um, he, he reached down to Elijah at his lowest point out of his grace. Uh, so how did the Lord restore him? First, he met his physical needs, food and rest. Sometimes we get so tired, so worn out, in life, you just need to t get some extra sleep. And your mind can work better. And um, sometimes you need some good, nutritious 
uh, food, not the, the fast foods, things like that. You need nutrients. And so the Lord gave him this food and rest. And, um, and then best part, I think, I wish I could spend the whole of this message on this particular passage. The Lord had an intimate talk with Elijah. He spoke to him and reassured him. Oh, when I read that, read this, is, I think of that song we sang a long while back, uh, Have a Little Talk with Jesus. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, the Lord just restored him. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, and the, Lord, and the word of the Lord came to him and asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Where are you? What are you doing here in life? What are you doing? And he replied, uh, verse 10, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I, I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Amen. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Elijah ran to Mount Horeb, the same mount where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And it says, when he heard the still small, the gentle whisper, he pulled the, the mantle over his face. I think at that point, he asked, that, he asked the same question two times. And then in ver he said it again in verse 13. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I think Elijah was restored at that point. He sensed the Lord speaking to him. If I had sensed God speaking to me that intimately, I would be restored too. I mean, and so the voice of the Lord um, restored him. The voice of the Lord. And when we come together and we study God's word and you study in private, that's your restoration. We need God's word and the Holy Spirit speaking to be restored. And um, verse 14, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, verse 15, get, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Haziel and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. The Lord gave Elijah a new assignment, a new, new uh, direction. He told him to anoint of all people, uh, Elisha, who would become his companion who will carry out the ministry and and also he, he, he restored him physically of his exhaustion and he gave him a new uh, a new assignment and Elijah went on to minister 10 more years 10 more years um, and one thing I, I, that I gleaned from this is this when we do ministry I'm, I'm I know many of you know this. You can't do it in the power of human, human flesh. You, you get burned out. You get tired. You will need to be restored. 
You have to depend on the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. And um, the Lord restored him. He gave him a, a traveling companion in Elisha who stayed with him to the end. He gave him a friend, a companion. And um, Elijah ministered 10 more years. And the Lord, in his grace, took him to heaven in a whirlwind without f seeing physical death. Amen. And then the results of Ahab, the wicked king, well, he listened to his lying prophets and went into battle and was killed. Yes. It said, and the scripture says the dogs licked up his blood. Jezebel, his wife, she was killed violently by the next wicked king of Israel. Scriptures tell us that she was devoured by dogs before she could be buried. Um, there, if there's someone, if someone said, well, I, I've, I come here today and I don't know the Lord who restores. I don't know the God of, who has created this world. Um, I don't know him and I'm in my sin. Well, today is the day you can get that correct. Um, and um, I'm just going to read a, I don't want to uh, hold you too long, but just want to read a short verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I, la I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And who wouldn't want to know a, Lord, a God like that? The God who restores the soul. And so if there's someone, I'm going to pray a short prayer. If there's someone here today who don't know the Lord in a personal way, um, I'm going to pray. And if you are that person, you can raise your hand and we have one of the counselors to, to speak with you and pray with you. So let us pray. Dear Lord, you created the world. You made man and the planets, the universe. And Lord, I know that you created me and I'm accountable. But because of my sin, I don't know you in a personal way. I never asked you or invited you to take control of my life and be reunited in a personal relationship with you, the God of the Bible, the creator. I thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood for my sins. Come into my life make me the kind of person you want me to be. If someone prayed that prayer for the first time, you raise your hand and someone will, will, will talk with you. God bless you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>